Our, <clears throat> our Old Testament reading this morning is from Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. And if you are able, please stand to show reverence to the Lord as we hear his word. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Our New Testament reading is from Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Please bow with me in prayer for the word. Lord, we thank you for your righteousness, your holiness. We thank you for your presence. As we come before you now, we pray that you would speak into each and every one of our hearts and our lives. Let us not be distracted by what's going on in our lives or the different things going on in the world. But let us wholly now devote ourselves to you, God, that we may be changed and transformed through your spirit to be more like you, all for your glory. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are in a battle. We're in a battle every day of our lives. But so many of us might wonder, what kind of battle are we in? Doesn't seem like I'm in any type of war or battle. But as Paul tells us in Ephesians, we're not in a battle of physical nature. But we're in a battle of spiritual nature. When I lived in South Korea, we're always in a state of war. The country is officially in a state of war at all times. And so there is uh, an army that is always on red alert because there could be war that breaks out at any time. And it'd be funny because from time to time I'd get phone calls or I'd get emails from friends and family that are living back in the United States. And they'd see all this news about, you know, South Korea and North Korea and the tension there and, you know, what's going to happen. And, you know, they'd call me and say, are you okay? Is everything all right in, in South Korea? You know, I heard about all these bombs and all these things and, and this potential war going on. And I would look, I, you know, I would, I would just tell them, I don't really know what you're talking about. You know, because over here, everything's pretty fine. You know, people don't even really, you know, care about what's going on, and, and they hear about it in the news, and they see about it, but, you know, it, it's such an everyday occurrence in South Korea, and it's on the news all the time, that it's just kind of like, oh, you know, North Korea, you know, is, is threatening us again, you know, and, and they just kind of become numb to it, and so my parents would call me and, oh, are you okay, you know, do you want to come back to the United States, and they'd be, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm pretty, it's pretty good living here. As I was preparing this sermon, I was reminded of my time in South Korea. Because we are in a spiritual war, and sometimes as Christians, we become numb to it. Because it's day in and day out. It's every morning, it's every evening. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, Pastor, we're in this war, and we're in a war, and we, we, you know, we're being sanctified every day. And I have to glorify God, and I, I shouldn't sin. And sometimes we become numb to this battle that we are in. Today's passage in Psalm, Psalm 24, talks about a king of glory, a king that leads his people in victory. The battle that we are in is one of glory. 
The battle that we are in will determine who receives the glory. Is it myself, the world, or this king of glory, the Lord? The first catechism of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? And you probably know the answer. Our junior high and senior high, I know you guys go through the catechism every year as well, so you probably also know this answer. The chief end of man is to do what? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. In other words, we have been created by our creator to glorify God. It is the highest good. It is the greatest satisfaction of the creation to glorify the creator. In other words, we find the greatest joy, we find the greatest satisfaction possible in our lives when we glorify God. How do we know this? Because God himself deems his own glory as superior above all else. Nothing supersedes the glory of God. God will always be glorified in any situation, in any circumstance, in any time period of the world, even during a COVID pandemic, God will be glorified. In his book, Desiring God, John Piper writes, God's own glory is uppermost in his own affections. In everything he does, his purpose is to preserve and display that glory. To say his glory is uppermost in his own affections means that he puts a greater value on it, on his glory, than on anything else. He delights in his glory above all things. And it is this emphasis, this uppermost affection, that God would be glorified above anything else. That is a premise. It is the theme of the entire Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament. It is the theme of our history, entire history of man, is the glory of God. God created man for his glory. In the Old Testament, we see that he leads his people into victory, and he leads, God is the one who does it. Why? Why does God choose Abraham? Why does God choose the Israelites? Why does he lead the Israelites out of Egypt through Moses? Why does he lead them into the promised land through Joshua? Why does he give them victory Why does he do all these things? It is for his own glory. The glory of God does not contend with anything else. And so we see this glory of God being consummated in his son, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 1, in the great prayer of Jesus, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the Son may glorify you. God, in his infinite wisdom, has made it so that he is glorified and exalted and magnified through his Son, Jesus Christ. Paul tells us, preceding today's New Testament text in Ephesians, that it was according to the purpose of God's will to bring himself glory to do what? To unite all things all things on heaven, all things on earth, everything becomes united together through one man, Jesus Christ. And it is through Jesus Christ that God receives the greatest glory. And so in Hebrews, we are told without faith, it is impossible to please him because God receives glory through the awesome redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And this stretches into our daily habits and deeds. And Paul reminds us that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice and that we must renew our minds so that we may live in honor and glory to God. Paul urges us that even when we eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. R.C. Sproul says, we do not segment our lives, giving some time to God and some to our business or schooling while keeping parts to ourselves. The idea is to live all of our lives in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and for the honor and glory of God. That is what the Christian life is all about. So it's quite apparent 
that as a Christian and just mankind in general, that our highest aim, our greatest purpose, and our greatest satisfaction is to glorify God. We must glorify God every single day in our daily living. That sounds easy. But if we leave it at this, what tends to happen is that when we try to glorify God, we find that we are actually not glorifying God. What R.C. Sproul says to not just segment our lives, but we need to give all of ourselves, every part, every aspect, all of our time, we need to do this to glorify God. But it's harder than, than it sounds, right? How do I glorify God in every part of my life? When we set out to glorify God in our lives, sometimes we say, all right, well, I'm going to glorify God like this. I feel like God will be glorified most if I do this, if I get this job, if I do this thing, if I do this good deed, if I'm morally good. And what sets out with good intentions to glorify God ends up something like Saul, where Saul, the king of Israel, he goes and he attacks and he defeats the Amalekites on the word of the Lord. The, the Lord tells him to do this. And he, dis, he destroys everything and he devotes it to the Lord. Except he leaves some things. He, he actually spares Agag, the king. And he leaves the best things. And his intent is good, right? He wants to give it to the Lord, these best things. But what does this, the Lord tell Saul? He says, it is better to do what? To obey. To obey my command. That is bringing me glory. To give me glory means to do what I tell you to do. Sometimes when we set out to give glory to God, we say, all right, well, I don't want to make any mistakes. So I'm going to live a sinless life. I'm going to try to do as best as I can. I'm going to follow all the laws. I'm going to be morally good. I'm going to get rid of all of those worldly, you know, secular things. And this is how I will bring glory to God. But somehow we end up like the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowds who, in their efforts to glorify God, crucified their own Savior. So why does this happen? Why do these good intentions of glorifying God result in glorifying ourselves or actually taking away the glory of God? And it is in this dilemma that Paul says, we are in a battle. We are not in a battle of physical nature, but we are in a battle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It is a battle that is, wo- that is waged within our souls, a battle that is waged within our hearts and our minds. And so throughout the letters of Paul, and especially in Romans chapter 7 and 8, Paul describes this battle as a battle between flesh and the spirit. He speaks of the dominion of darkness versus the kingdom of light. It is a battle that we as Christians are fighting every single day to give glory to God through our lives. I want to be clear for a moment that the war has already been won. The war has been won through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Paul proclaims in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the war has already been won. But the battle wages on. The enemy, the devil, he thinks maybe I can, maybe I can you know, trip up this person or maybe I can make this person think this or do this. And the battle wages on until we are glorified, until Christ comes again. We live in a state of sanctification awaiting our glorification until Christ returns. And each day we battle with the evil one who hopes to turn us away from our Lord and our Savior, of course, in futility. And in this incomplete state, on this side of heaven, we are still prone to fail 
and even to fall into sin. But this is not to discourage us. It is not to make us feel like we are unworthy. But it is to lead us to depend on our Savior, King of glory, even more. In this battle, we must have a greater desire to glorify God than to glorify ourselves or to receive glory in this world. I'm going to say that one more time. In this battle for glory, we must desire, our inclination must be to glorify my Savior, King of glory, more than to glorify myself or to be glorified in this world. Now, where does this desire come from? See, I think a lot of times the reason why we get tripped up in our daily battles is because we, for some reason, are tricked into believing that this desire and this way of living and and this bringing glory to God depends on me. And that's where we get tripped up. Because this desire, this inclination, this glory, it does not come from me. But in fact, it comes from God himself. And so, though we may fail in some aspects of our lives, every day, we can still claim glory through Jesus Christ because God is glorified not by what I do or what I don't do, but it is through Jesus Christ that he is glorified. And so it is through my faith in Christ that God is glorified through me. And where does faith come from? Paul says in Ephesians 2, the chapter that proceeds after the chapter that we read today, He says it comes from the grace of God. It is a gift of God. And so whenever we are tempted to be discouraged in this battle, we must remember that those who have faith and trust in Christ have been made to be, as Paul says, holy and blameless before him, adopted as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now today's psalm reminds us of this reality. The king of Israel, David, he is writing the psalm, but he says that there is a king that is far greater than he, this great king of glory. Who is this king of glory? He says that he is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord of the battle, He is the Lord of hosts. Obviously, David is speaking about God. David confesses that this true king is the one who truly gives success and victory. He is God Almighty, and he is the one who deserves glory alone. David says, stop thinking that I'm a great king. Stop thinking that I'm bringing you victory. Stop thinking that I'm a great warrior. You know that Goliath guy? the one that I slayed, right? Stop thinking that it was because of who I am or because of the power that I have. He says, there is a king who is greater than I. He is the king who deserves all the glory. And so today's passage, David calls us and, of course, the Israelites to lift our heads and to fix our gaze upon this king of glory who comes in, and he comes in with strength and might. He is the Lord of the battle. And so Tremper Longman in his commentary says of Psalm 24, it encourages Christian readers that their God continues to fight for them in the midst of the turmoil of life. They also wait and hope for the future reappearance of their warrior, Jesus Christ, who will bring all evil, human and spiritual, to an end. The reason why we many times hide or even take God's glory in our lives is because we replace him or we try to replace him with another leader, with another king, another one who we want to glorify. And in the circumstances of our lives, we find that other things that seem strong or they seem mighty might be able to replace this great king of glory. But each time we do this, it only leads to more frustration, to more fear, even sin. 
because we will never be able to achieve a victory in this spiritual battle on our own. Nor will the world give us any victory. So every day we are in a battle. A battle that determines who will receive this glory. And so my question for you this morning is who is your king of glory? Who receives the glory in your life? God, in his wisdom, set up everything in creation, in this world, the heavens and the earth, to glorify himself. And he says, there's nothing that can compete with that. Yet in our lives every day, there are things that compete with that glory. The question is, what is it? Now, I'm not pointing you in this question to try to think about what kind of Christian, Christian religious deeds or acts or works that you do in your daily life versus the ones that are not Christian-like, that are secular. I'm not trying to make you think about, all right, well, what good things do I do and what bad things do I do and, 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 and try to cut out those bad things. Yes, you should cut out those bad things. But before that, there's a root. It is the heart. It is the mind. It is your greatest motive, the highest satisfaction of your heart. It is the greatest desire to see Christ being magnified and glorified in every area of your life. Is your chief end to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. If God is truly my King of glory, then any circumstance, any situation in my life will bring him glory. See, what we have to remember and what we have to make clear in our lives is that no matter what I do and no matter how I live, God will receive glory. Whether I do good things and I try to live my best life, he will receive glory. And whether I fail and fall into temptation and sin, he will still receive glory. So the question is, then why should I live, you know, a godly life? Why should I live in holiness? Why should I follow Jesus? Why should I do these things? Because as our hearts have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, our chief end, our desire as children of God is to do what? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And this is the premise behind Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. And we must realize and recognize that God is not looking for the perfect soldier. We don't give glory to God in the battle because we are perfect. We give glory to God in the battle regardless of how awful of a soldier we are because he is perfect. We lose the battle when we or anything else tries to take place of that when we are tricked into thinking that this Savior King is looking for the best soldier, the one who can do it all, the one who could please him, the one that can have all of the talents and all the things and do it perfectly. God knows. God knows how fallible, how broken, and how sinful we are, and that is the beauty of God's love and his grace because he still chooses us to fight this battle. In an excerpt from Table Talk magazine on the subject of the glory of God, it reads, In saving his people and defeating their enemies, God's glory is displayed. Salvation must be sola fide, sola gratia, and solus Christus, through faith alone, by grace alone, and on account of Christ alone, because to attribute redemption to our efforts in any way is to rob God of his full glory. If God and God alone is not the one who saves, then he shares his glory with his creatures. So in this battle that we are in, In this battle against sin, against temptation, against all these wicked things, it is not that we try to make ourselves perfect so that we are worthy before this King of glory. We bring glory when we attribute everything to him and give him glory in every circumstance of our lives. 
And so don't lose focus of our glorious King who has lavished on us his great love and his grace. Don't get distracted by the enemy and the enemy's lies. Don't get distracted in the battle by the surrounding debris or the noise around you. But as David says in today's psalm, lift up your head and fix your gaze on this glorious Savior King who has already brought us this victory. He has chosen us and created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now here's the kicker. When God chose you and me to be regenerated, to have saving faith and to follow Jesus, he already knew how sinful we were. He already knew how sinful we would be. God didn't choose you and I because we had it all together and we're perfect. He knew our struggles, he knew our failures, he knew our sins. And knowing that in our perspective, we are just, we feel like a hindrance sometimes to God's glory, right? God, why did you choose someone so weak as me, so sinful as me? To us, it seems like we're just a handicap to God in this battle. But to God, he has perfectly chosen those who he has predestined to fulfill his perfect work and his perfect will. So the spiritual battle is not won by just doing the right thing as a Christian or following some certain religious rules. It is won by depending only on the one who has already won this war. In his supreme wisdom, God has chosen to be glorified throughout all generations through his son, Jesus Christ, through us, we who were dead in our trespasses. He has made alive together in Jesus Christ through the grace of God. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 10, Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs not to me, but belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And so, brothers and sisters, every single day, let us look to Jesus Christ so that we may, in fact, glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your glorious grace, the immeasurable grace that you have lavished on us in your love to choose these vessels such as us, these jars of clay, so that, Lord, through us, even in this battle, that you may receive all of the glory in our lives. And so, Lord, every day that we wake up, And every night that we go to sleep, let us depend not on ourselves, not on the world or any worldly things. Let us only depend on the faith that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ, that we may glorify you in our lives. And we pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.